And once again, uh, welcome everybody uh, to the session today. We're gonna go over the new employee self-service application that we've created. Uh, this is gonna be a very much a user-focused demo. So I will, I will go a bit into uh, a few of the more technical uh, behind the scenes um, aspects uh, as we go through, but uh, I'm not gonna focus a tremendous amount on some of the more technical minutia. I'm gonna try to really make this more of a user-focused demo. Um, and if you have questions, uh, we, we are gonna mute everybody initially just to prevent uh, feedback as we proceed. But if you have a question, uh, I do have Michelle Dravis monitoring the chat. So she will be looking for questions in the chat and relay those to me. Or if you prefer, you can also um, unmute to ask a question. But uh, we would just ask that you please uh, mute after you've asked your question just to prevent any, any feedback. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, first off, I have a very brief uh, presentation here I wanted to run through that just highlights some of the, the key details associated with the employee self-service. And then after that, I'm going to move directly into the, the demo of the, of the application itself. So first off, um, sorry, one second, there's a lot of people in the waiting room. So let me click admit all super quick here, get them in here. Um, First of all, there was some there was some key uh, design goals that we started off with when we began developing this product, uh, and we we started development on this in September. So I'm uh, I'm, I'm very happy with the progress that has been made, and, and hopefully uh, you you will be as well as you see see the demo the demo moving forward here. Uh, but what we really tried to do <clears throat> is for those that are using the legacy kiosk application. Uh, we we refer to it now as the legacy kiosk application since we since it does have a a defined end of life date. Um, although many of you probably just know it as the kiosk or the HR kiosk. Uh, but at any rate, <clears throat> um, that particular application, we as the uh, state software development team do not uh, develop the legacy kiosk application. Uh, however, that application is uh, part of the overall management council product suite. So we have uh, quite a bit of insight into that application and also the ability to um, coordinate uh, some things that I'll talk about, which we believe will make the conversion from that product to the new employee self-service product uh, much less painful than, than, than it would be if, if we didn't have some level of control on both sides uh, of the house there. Uh, so anyways, we were trying to, you know, the, the main thing we were trying to do is re re reproduce all of the core uh, legacy kiosk functionality. Uh, there are uh, there were a very few features that uh, when we did some analysis to determine the usage of those features and how much benefit they provided, um, we determined that uh, at least for the initial release of the employee self service uh, product, it, it really wasn't worthwhile to implement those. Uh, the primary one that falls into that category is the performance reviews that were available in the uh, legacy kiosk application. That was really just a pretty much a place to house to house a uh, a file that was shared between the supervisor and the employee. Uh, and because there are so many alternatives to that particular functionality, that was one that we did not decide to carry forward uh, with the initial rollout of this application. Now that being said, um, you know when we when we reach the production release, which I'll talk a bit about those dates here in just a moment, uh, that doesn't mean that we're done developing this application. This will be a, a supported application and will continue to be developed past that point. So we certainly can expand on um, some of this functionality based on user user feedback uh, post-production. But for the very first release, as I said, uh, the performance reviews in particular are, are not gonna be a part of, of what we're implementing here. So another goal we had was <clears throat> we wanted to improve the design and the user experience, but also try to keep the overall flow and, and look and feel of the application fairly similar to the, to the legacy kiosk. Uh, and, and that's really, the main goal there is to alleviate uh, unnecessary training for those that are already used to using the kiosk application. So if you use the kiosk currently, you'll see when we go into the demo, 
it should feel very familiar to you. It, there are differences. We made it, we made what we believe are improvements in certain areas, but we didn't drastically change the, the overall design of the application in terms of look and feel. Um, because once again, we wanted to keep it relatively close to alleviate un, unneeded uh, training uh, burden on the part of the schools and the ITCs that are using uh, the kiosk currently. A few key improvements that we made, as I mentioned, some user interface improvements that you'll see as we proceed with the demo. Uh, we also, these next two are a little bit uh, maybe behind the scenes and technical in nature, but we do believe are important. And that's, uh, we've, we've added Active Directory integration. So what that means is if you have a, um, a username and password that you're utilizing through your ITC, for instance, to log into other products that authenticates against their Active Directory. Uh, we have the ability to tie that same authentication method into the employee self-service application. So, you know, therefore you can re, you don't have to have a completely separate uh, username and password uh, in order to log into this application, if you choose to integrate it with the existing your existing Active Directory, uh, we also added uh, two-factor authentication support uh, using uh, a product called Duo, which is developed by Cisco. Um, this is the standard two-factor authentication uh, provider that we currently use with our other state software applications, USAS, USPS, etc. So. That's a feature that was not in the legacy kiosk. And, and everybody, as everybody knows um, today with security being a primary concern uh, and, and auditors in particular, um, you know, starting to really look at uh, two-factor authentication as another level of security. Uh, we believe that will be very useful as well uh, should you choose to enable that to once again, just add another layer of security to the application. Um, and because we obviously develop the USPS application, the employee self-service application will be very tightly integrated with our payroll application. Uh, and you'll see uh, some of the places that that will um, come into play as we look at the demo. Um, the primary one being we are in the current legacy kiosk application. Uh, if you want to export your, if you want to take your leave, your approved leave request from the kiosk, and get them into USPS, you do that through extracting a CSV file and then using the load programs in USPS to load that data. Uh, that is still an option. We did not eliminate that option. So if your um, you know, internal business practices are such that you wanna continue doing an extract and load to get that data over, you absolutely can do that. Uh, but we also added a, a direct posting to USPS. So you'll actually be able to uh, from the, um, the the leave extract screen, you'll actually be able to either generate a CSV file or just simply directly post that data in USPS. So it kind of, it, it, it's a little uh, more streamlined in that it eliminates that, uh, that extract and load process. If you just want to directly post, you have the option to do that. And, and I'll show that as well as we get into the demo. Another thing we were very dialed into <clears throat> is we wanted to try and um, you know, facilitate the conversion from the legacy kiosk to the new employee self-service application um, by, you know, once again, because we, um, you know, the, the the legacy kiosk itself is uh under the management council umbrella, uh, we have the abil ability to work with the the kiosk developers to have them provide to us data extracts from that application that we can then load into the employee self-service application. So this is going to save a lot of time in terms of moving from one product to the other, uh, because it will not require manually setting up things like users and the roles that those users have, um, and your workflows that uh, you you've all established already in terms of you know for these particular employees, these are the steps that this leave must go through. These are the people that must approve it for uh for that leave to be considered fully approved and available for export so we're, we're going to import that information so those workflows will not have to be reconfigured uh in the employee self-service application and also all of your district configuration data so you know what uh what leave types are available uh what positions are are listed in terms of active inactive etc all of that various configuration data that the uh kiosk application allowed you to set up 
we'll import that, we'll extract that from the kiosk, import that into the employee self-service. So between those three things, uh, with the export and the import, the application should be fairly well uh, configured uh, without a lot of manual tweaking uh, being necessary uh, post, post that import process. Matt, we do have a couple of, uh, just a couple of questions there in the chat. Uh, sure. Let me look here. Um, will it auto calculate the amount of leave requests based on times requested off? Um, no, it does not. It, it works very similar to the way that the existing kiosk works. So if you say, I'm going to take, uh, you know, three days of leave, uh, then, you know, you would enter your date range in and then it, it does as, as the kiosk does currently, it will pop up a, uh, basically a secondary dialogue that will show you the, the days in that range. And then you will say, let's say I said, I'm going to take, um, 2.5 days over the course of a three day period, for instance, then I would say, I'm going to take one day on this date, one day on this day, and then the 0.5 day on this date. So that, that is the way that that works. Um, so history, we are not bringing over leave history. So when the, um, <clears throat> when the, what we're going to do, is our, our guidance will be when you're ready to convert from the legacy kiosk to the new employee self-service application, uh, you'll want to have all of the leave that currently exists in the legacy kiosk in a fully approved state. Um, and then uh, at that point in time, uh, you know, you can, you can migrate and then any new leave that's requested would need to be requested inside of the employee self-service application. Part of the um, extracts that we are getting from the kiosk, we're actually extracting all of the data, uh, all of the history, all of the information that existed in the, in the kiosk, even though obviously we're not importing all of that data, uh, the extracts will contain that. And, and that is also serving as not just the, once again, a, a way in which we can import those key pieces of data that will be required to streamline the setup, but also serves as an archival copy of all of that data. So if there is ever a reason that you need to really go back and look at some sort of, um, detail about a leave request that was approved, uh, you know, a year ago or six months ago or whatever, um, you will still have access to that data in terms of being able to utilize those extracts to retrieve it. Um, let's see, does everyone have to set up uh, two-factor authentication? No, uh, it is a option uh, that is configured in the application. So it is not a requirement that you use it, but, um, you know, obviously based on Oh, I guess Michelle actually answered that one. Sorry, Michelle. Uh, yeah, based on, uh, uh, you know, your security policies or, um, you know, your decision internally will, or, you know, in collaboration with your ITC, depending upon where that uh, division of responsibility is at, uh, you'll be able to make that determination. Um, will you be able to make adjustments before posting directly to USPS? Not through the direct post method, no. Um, <clears throat> now, if you obviously, if you if you extract the data in a CSV file and then you choose to manipulate that data prior to loading, then yes, you would be able to make adjustments. But we do not uh, currently. If you do direct posting to USPS, whatever is um, whatever has been approved is what will be posted. Obviously, you could then go into the USPS application and make adjustments post the post the posting, but you cannot make adjustments prior to directly posting inside of uh, the application. Um, once we convert to employee self-service, someone forgot to enter a day in kiosk, will they still be able to enter the day in the new system? Uh, yes, they will still be able to enter that day in the new system. Um, there's no limitation in terms of, we're not allowing you to enter dates prior to uh, the actual conversion. So yes, they would, they would be able to do that. We're just asking that anything that's outstanding uh, is fully approved uh, prior to um, the conversion from the old application to the new application. All right, I think oh. only approved leave. What if a leave is approved but not posted? Will it transfer? 
Um, only approved leave will be exported, but if a leave approved is not posted, will it transfer? Um, Vicki, do you mind unmuting this? Yeah, yeah. I, I was trying to type that really fast before you got back. So the way that I understood it was that only leave that's in the fully approved status will be exported, uh, migrated, migrated over. Um, and so if if it's been fully approved but not posted into payroll, that will still come over with the migration. Um, no. So just to clarify, any leave that's fully approved in the in the legacy kiosk application will not come over to the employee self service application. However, um, we and this will become a little clearer as I'm going to talk about the dates here. But you will not um, lose all access to the legacy kiosk application immediately upon converting. What you will not want to do though, is have anybody posting new leave into the legacy kiosk application. However, okay. like leave administrators, for instance, will still have the ability to um, go into the legacy kiosk application and extract the leave that has been approved from there and, and, and import that until the point in time at which all approved leave has been you know, fully exported. Uh, and then at that point in time, you really don't have a reason to have to actually access the legacy kiosk. Does that okay, make sense? perfect. Yep, it makes perfect sense. Thank you. Okay. Um, and I think Mark answered that one in terms of error, uh, an error uh, like when we upload. Um, yes, there will be errors. Um, and I think Michelle got that one. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to scroll through here. Yeah, I'm going to talk about frontline integration. So uh, we'll, we'll get to that one here in just a second. Um, uh, yeah, the uh, I think Mark is, Mark can address the lockout one, but yeah, there'll be there's ways that you can disable access in the legacy kiosk application to ensure that uh, nobody is able to um, inadvertently enter leave post the the date of conversion. Um, okay, so I will let Mark and Michelle continue to uh, monitor the questions in chat, answer what they can, and uh, Michelle, if there's one that uh, comes up that I need to address, please let me know and I will do so. Okay, so there's a few key dates that I wanted to also talk about up front here. Uh, so we're currently in what we're calling an early access phase for the employee self-service application. Uh, we released the, er the first early access version of the application on May 3rd. Uh, what we are doing in the early access phase, uh, it, it is not the application is not 100% feature complete, and I'll talk about in the next slide the, the few things we're still working on. Um, but it has the uh, the vast majority of all the information or all the functionality, I should say, that uh, that you'll need um, in in order to use this application. Um, and we we are we are we release it early because. One of the re one of the realities of software development that maybe some vendors will not admit to when they're providing a demo of an application is that we will never catch every problem in our internal testing. Um, there's just too many variables, too many variations, too many things people can do uh, in the real world in that application that is very, very hard to test all those permutations. Um, and and catch everything. So releasing in the early access phase allows us to get the application out there, allow those people that uh, that that are brave enough or uh, excited enough to to begin using the application before its official production release to begin using the application. And then we have a a very tight feedback loop where any issues they they find that we are unaware of, they can report to us. Uh, we can fix those and we can, you know, release updates. And it's it, it's the best way we know to make the application as stable and as functional as possible uh, for the first production release, which is scheduled for July 1 of 2024. Through the early access phase, we're committing to actually releasing new versions of the application on a weekly basis. So we will be having, a, we will have a very, very quick turnaround in terms of uh, feedback and release. So we will continue to monitor for issues, fix those issues, push new versions of the application out. So we're gonna we're gonna move very quickly uh, in the early access phase uh, to to address those those issues that uh, that people do find. And as I said, then 
uh, July 1st, we will hit official production. So at that point in time, doesn't mean that, uh, you know, all work is done. Uh, all work definitely will not be done. As I said, there will be, there will probably still be bugs, uh, that we will find, um, that, that we don't detect in early access. Uh, but also, you know, we will continue to develop and, uh, add enhancements based on user feedback, et cetera, et cetera. So this application will be under support and development on an ongoing basis. Uh, there, there's no intention to stop working on this application, so to speak, once that July date hit, is hit. Um, for the legacy kiosk application, um, all, uh, all schools that are currently using the legacy kiosk will have to be uh, using either the employee self-service application or you know potentially another alternative if if you're using uh, another product uh, that you know you don't have to use the employee self service application but we we anticipate that uh, that almost everybody that's currently using the legacy kiosk will be using the employee self service but nonetheless you must be on another alternative solution by September 30th of 2024 for all functionality in the existing legacy kiosk with the exception of the ippy dippy component. Uh, we, we're going to extend the, the access for the Ippy Dippy component to 7-1 of 2025. Uh, and that was done based on feedback we received from both the, both schools and ITCs that were concerned, um, because unlike with the other features of the, uh, employee kiosk, we have a very clear alternative that, that we developed internally, um, there was not such a thing for Ippy Dippy and, and really um, the Ippy Dippy piece of kiosk uh, felt a little bolted on in that it doesn't really fit with the other functionality in terms of being very closely integrated and related to the USPS system. Um, so at any rate, we've decided to extend the um, the actual access for Ippy Dippy to 7-1 of 2025. And we are internally looking at developing a, uh, a, a SSDT alternative to uh, the Ippy Dippy functionality that exists in the kiosk. So that also gives us much more runway to actually be able to look at that and uh, you know work on developing an alternative. Now, obviously there are also alternatives out there that are not um, created internally by us. So you know once again, um, you know it, the choice is, is up to the school in terms of which product they believe um, best suits their needs and and, and they uh, they wish to to move to. So those are the dates that I wanted to convey up front. Uh, and I had mentioned previously that in the early access fee phase, we do still have some things that we're working on. Uh, one of those things is is timesheets. Um, a timesheet the timesheet feature of the legacy kiosk was was not widely used um, and there were some limitations with it, some issues. It, it, it didn't get a lot of, uh, adoption. So we didn't, for a lot of these other features, you're going to say, you're going to see, as I said, we, we really kind of use the legacy kiosk as our design document in terms of how should this work? How should it look, et cetera. That's sort of the baseline. And then we made some decisions and diverged in certain ways that we thought were better, but we didn't drastically diverge with timesheets. Due to the fact that the the user adoption was so minimal, uh, we decided to go a, a, down a slightly different path with that. And we actually formed a user focus group that's uh, made up of both ITC staff and schools that are currently using the timesheet functionality inside of the legacy kiosk so that we could really sort of build that from the ground up. So that is still still ongoing at this point in time. Um, as I said, we will, you know, we'll have that functionality available prior to the production release, but it is not part of the current early access uh, offering. We're also still working on frontline integration. Uh, we are in communication with frontline concerning this. Uh, there is going to be, if you're using frontline integration, there is some difference here in terms of how it works currently and how it will work moving forward. Uh, in the in the legacy kiosk application, there's this concept of a kind of a bi-directional integration between the uh, frontline, I believe they call it absence management now, but it used to be ASOP. Uh, and you could essentially enter leaves in frontline and then those would flow to the employee kiosk 
or you could enter leaves in the kiosk and then they would float to frontline. Um, this is one thing that caused no end of issues in terms of support. Uh, it was a very, uh, a, a very um, frustrating thing for, for users, for ITCs, uh, and for those that also supported the legacy kiosk inside of the management council. So we determined what, what we decided to do is to try to simplify this integration and to make this a one-way integration. But this does change. This is a change in terms of uh, how schools will have to interact with with uh, both of these applications now. So the, the way this is going to work is if you have an employee that needs to use the frontline absence, man absence management product because they require the substitute scheduling functionality that exists inside of frontline, then they will need to add that information in the on the frontline side. Uh, that information will be approved on the frontline side, and then that information will flow into the uh, employee self service application. At which point it can be uh, extracted or directly posted to USPS. So, so that will be in the way in which that integration works. Uh, we will not have data entered in the employee self service application flow back to the frontline product. So that is a that is probably the biggest difference between the legacy kiosk and the uh, employee self service application for those that are using frontline. Um, let me check chat real quick because there may be some. Um, uh, oh, sorry, there's a lot of questions in here. I'm gonna have to scroll up a bit. Uh, looks like Michelle got that one. Uh, are you able to provide other applications? Yes. Yeah, so, um, backing up a little bit on the frontline integration, <clears throat> this has been a this has been somewhat frustrating um, for us because. Uh, we had to change change our tact a little bit on times in terms of how we're integrating with Frontline because uh, we've created a REST API, which, sorry, that's a bit of a, a, a technical term, but basically it's a, it's a way in which people can post um, absences, post leave to our application employee self-service. So our initial plan was to have Frontline actually utilize the API that we've created um, to post information. However, um, based on their internal development schedules, et cetera, they're not going to be able to make that happen before July 1st. So we're having to change the way in which we integrate with them. And we're going to have to, and this is kind of part of the reason of why we're a little behind on, on and we didn't have this available for early access as well, because we, we needed to change tack now. We're actually going to have to leverage their APIs to pull that information from them versus having them push that information to us, which is not quite as efficient. Uh, also adds, there's still a little bit of a support burden there because now we don't have visibility into, we don't have full visibility into if there's an issue, if, if we try to pull something from frontline and it doesn't come over correctly, it doesn't come over at all. We have no choice, but to try to, um, you know, have the school contact frontline to figure out that issue because all we know is all we can see is what we got from them. Whereas if they were pushing to us, then obviously we have like full visibility in terms of what they sent us, when they sent us, when they sent it to us, what the format was, you know, if there was an issue, why the issue occurred. Um, so at any rate, that's a bit of a tangent off the original question, but that REST API does exist. So if there is another third-party vendor, um, you know, obviously we're targeting frontline because they were the ones that were integrating with the legacy kiosk application. So therefore we wanted to make sure that we have some level of integration for, um, for schools that were utilizing that, uh, integration in the legacy kiosk. However, if there are other vendors out there that are interested in integrating using the API that I, uh, just, um, briefly discussed, that certainly is a possibility. We don't have any right now that uh, have approached us to do so, um, but yes, that is definitely possible. Um, I'll mark ask for some additional information on that one, um, but I think I pretty well addressed it. Um, w4 um, it4 direct deposit forms to employee self service. Um, mark, do you? Okay, yep, he addressed it. Yes, so that is. 
that is something that has been uh, brought up and that we are um, looking at um, as a future enhancement, not something that obviously will be available um, for the first version. Um, the question about timesheets in Frontline, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not entirely sure what uh, what the timesheet Frontline integration is. So uh, I don't know if, uh, Caitlin, you can clarify that slightly. I mean, I guess the answer is if that information was, was flowing from the legacy kiosk to Frontline and there's no other place that that was coming from, then the answer to your question would be, that it will not show on the timesheets in front. So Matt, this is Caitlin. Um, so what it currently works is when our employees put a leave request into kiosk, that inform that leave request once approved will show up on the employee's timesheet as you know, like it'll say vacation leave point two five day. Uh yeah. That that becomes a tracking nightmare on our side to go through and do that with each and every timesheet without that integration um so to answer your question um as it stands right now uh i think you're gonna have a tracking nightmare because yes it will not show on the uh timesheet however we are going to meet with frontline to uh just later today actually to follow up on some of this integration um so i will i will discuss that a bit more with them because what we really don't the real issue that we're trying to prevent is um, the issue with actually sort of the the leave approval and the substitute scheduling pieces uh, and the bi-directional relationship that existed there. Um, if, if this is, and, and I will tell you quite honestly, um, I, I don't know that I can commit to having something, if that is something that we can pursue, having that available for July, just based on the timelines that exist right now. Um, but if there is like a, because there is some data that frontline is pulling from, uh, the legacy kiosk right now, uh, that we are supporting, um, uh, some position information and some employee information that they utilize in their application for, I'm not entirely sure what, but some setup, et cetera. Um, so if that is one that is going to be super painful, um, we could certainly, you know, see if that's some information that we could also um, send to them just so that it would show up on, on the timesheets for the employee. Um, but as it stands right now, no, that information would not flow to, to frontline. Um, admin approve ASA to approve an ASA now. E admin approve. Yeah, yeah. So yes, if the um if the supervisor or the admin um was not ever going into ASOP, but they have employees that um require the usage of the ASOP product, then they would go into the ASOP product in order to approve that leave. Yes. Uh, I think I, the second question is pretty much the same question. Uh, yeah. And I mean, uh, I kind of addressed the reason why we are going with a unidirectional integration. Um, uh, in terms of changes, I will have to follow up with frontline on that particular question um uh but i would i would assume that um i guess it depends on what they're providing us through their api right um this is something we're still trying to hash out like i said because we did have to sort of change course in terms of how we were planning to do this um but if they give us uh if you had a absence in frontline that uh somehow is modified on the frontline side, as long as we get that information as part of the poll that we're going to have to do, then I would expect that we could update that uh, in the kiosk side, um, or I'm sorry, in the employee self-service side. So I'm not sure uh, exactly why that wasn't happening in the legacy kiosk, but uh, Mark, if you can make a note of that one and also the timesheet question, um, I will try to follow up on those with frontline specifically. Um, and question about uh, considering developing a way to generate payroll 
transactions to pay the subs who accept openings within Frontline. Uh, Mark, uh, do you want to talk, speak to that one? I don't think that's one that we have uh, necessarily heard before. Uh, however, that may be possible as a future enhancement. Um, is that anything that you've uh, previously heard about, Mark? No, I have not. Okay. We let's uh we'll make note of that. I, I do believe, Brian, that's the first time we've heard that particular request. Um, but basically that would be like, here's the substitute that's working for this person, and then you want a way to have the employee self-service application actually generate a you know uh up to kale, um, or I guess we call it now payroll payments future uh entry um that uh will then we, we've built that here at Southwestern ourselves. And so we're, until we can kind of replace that, we probably will continue with our older tools. Okay. Um, yeah, we can, uh, we can certainly track that um, as a, as an enhancement request, Brian, but yeah, that I believe that is the first time we've heard that. So there's no current, there's nothing currently on, you know, our roadmap, at least for this product. Uh, but once again, that doesn't mean that's not something that we could consider for a future enhancement. Thanks. Um, that looks like Mark got that one. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to, I think Mark and, and Michelle are working to uh, answer some of these questions, but uh, so I'm, I, I don't want to, you know, obviously we have limited time. I don't want to spend all of it in the chat, but uh, Mark and Michelle, please, if there are items that you need me to address, um, just, just interject and and I will do so. Whoops. Okay. So that did I hold on one second. I may have. Yes. Sorry. I think we stopped here and I didn't talk about this. Um, the final thing that's currently under development that I just wanted to mention is the configuration import. I had mentioned, you know, we're, there's some key things that we're trying to import to really smooth the conversion process and configuration is one of them. Uh, we're still waiting on some additional um, mapping, essentially, of what uh, the values for these various configuration options are inside of the legacy kiosk application. So we don't have that particular import completely finished yet. So that is one that we're still we're still trying to uh, to finalize. Okay, so let me go ahead at this point and switch over to the demo um so obviously this is the landing page uh nothing super exciting here uh we do have the ability for users to say that they forgot their password and you know what's your username and they will receive an email with a, a temporary password that um, it is configurable in terms of how long uh, that particular temporary password will be value uh, valid for um i think by default it may be five minutes but uh at any rate, um, they'll get that temporary password. They can use that to log in and then they'll have to obviously set a, uh, a new password. Um, there are some baked in password complexity rules in this application. Um, and Mark, off the top of your head, do you remember the, the rules in terms of password complexity? Uh, minimum length of 10, I think. Um, capital letter lowercase letter, special character, number, all the requirement. Okay. So yeah, so like I said, there is some some password complexity built in to you know, ensure some level of security. Um, also from here, if you forgot your username, if, you, know, you can enter your email address and you will receive an email that will tell you what your username is. Um, username does not have to match email address. Uh, when when the users are initially imported, obviously whatever username they were using to log into the legacy kiosk application will be their username. Uh, I had mentioned previously the fact that we implemented Active Directory support. So uh, it may be if, if you want to utilize the Active Directory support that you're not going to be able to use the same username that you used for the legacy kiosk because you need that username to match what, what is associated with your Active Directory. Uh, we have we have uh, also implemented the ability to um, mass to mass uh, mass load essentially users to modify that. So uh, if that's something that um, the ITC uh, in, in collaboration with with your school wishes to do, uh, we we've we've built a mechanism to try and 
you know, make that feasible without having to manually change however many users may exist in your district. Okay, so I'm using some demo data here. <clears throat> the first the first person I'm going to log in with is going to be just a standard employee. Uh, they're they're not going to have any additional um, access above. You know, I can go in, I can enter leave requests, I can see my own data, etc. So let's go ahead and log in. Uh, the first thing you're going to see here is we have kind of a landing page. Um, this is also in dark mode currently. One of the things that we built, um, let's just go look at the profile first. We can run through this real quick. So here's the user profile. I mean, some basic information that's coming from USPS. Uh, they, they do have the ability to set a default uh, phone number for leave requests that they create. So if they fill this in, then... Uh, whatever phone number they have on here will be auto-populated so they don't have to necessarily uh, put that on every single uh, leave request. We also have the ability right now to opt out of leave request emails. This is an all or nothing feature. So if I if I check this, then I'm not going to get notifications when my supervisor approves a leave or when my leave meets final approval, et cetera. Um, also, you can set default start and end times. So these basically would typically coincide with your, you know, your set shift um, so that you don't have to, uh, you know, select that information every time you enter a leave request. And it shows the roles that this person has. And obviously right now, as I said, this is just a, a, a basic user. So the only role they have is the user role. And then this is just a little, you can switch between either dark mode or light mode, depending on your preference. Um Okay, so let's pop back over here, uh, talk a little bit about the uh, the home screen. Uh, this is the user's home screen. When we go into uh, the next employee, which is a supervisor, you're gonna see uh, they're gonna have a, a, some more information available from here. Uh, but right now we have, these are district announcements. So if I click on this, um, you know, there's a, you know, basically graduation, here's some information about graduation, et cetera. Um, I will show you when I pop over to the next employee, they have the ability to actually add announcements. So I'll kind of show you, show you how that works. Um, and you can add, when we do that, you'll see that announcements can have a start time, a start date and an end date. So, you know, they will not appear until that start date is hit and then they will automatically go away uh, once that, uh, that end date is reached. And then over here, we have some custom links. So these are, um, you know, also I'll show you, this can be configured at the district level um, if the person has the appropriate role so that you can say, you know, here's some useful links that uh, we have at our school that we want you to, you know, be able to see right away and access from the landing page here of the employee self-service application. Uh, next, we have the employee's profile, and all of this data is coming from USPS, as I said. Um, there is a little bit of caching that occurs in certain areas of the application. Uh, we did that for the sake of performance. Um, when we initially developed this application, we were, not, we were not caching anything, so we were just pulling everything direct from USPS for you know every time the employee went into these screens. Um, certain areas, this actually ended up being a performance issue, uh, so we decided to do some data caching to try and um, you know make the the make it much more performant, much more quicker from the user's perspective. And um, those caches, um, the, there is an there is an admin feature that will allow you to initially build those caches when you convert uh, from the legacy kiosk application to the employee self service application. Post that point though, uh, when the employee every time the employee logs back in, uh, we're updating those caches behind the scenes for the employee. So this data should be pretty real time. Uh, but if you, if you make like a change in USPS um, and the employee has, is logged in, uh, they may have to simply log out and log back in for, for that, uh, that data change to show up inside of the employee self-service application. Uh, okay. So the employee profile, um, this is, like I said, we made a slight uh, change here in terms of look and feel uh, from the legacy kiosk application. Uh, I believe the legacy kiosk application had everything just sort of listed straight down the screen. We've, we've decided to break things out a bit by tabs. <clears throat> and um, 
when we switch over to the other employee, I can show you as well that there is configuration options that allow you to either, um, you know, show or hide basically these various areas of the employee profile. Um, so, you know, right here we have some, some basic information about the employee, you know, their employee number, their, you know, certificate ID, if they have it, name, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one thing I will mention up front here is we have been stressing for a very long time, probably going on a decade or more now, that uh, you should not be using the social security number as the employee number. Uh, th th there are still some schools out there that are using the social security number as the employee number. We would once again, highly recommend that you do not do that uh, and that you actually use a you know employee number that is not the social security number just to limit the um you know the risk of some sort of a um breach in which social security numbers are exposed uh because we are not with the exception of as you'll see that the w2 information uh because we are retrieving w2 information from U the usps file store and obviously well i i believe i don't know exactly when we did this two-ish years ago three-ish years ago we, we do have the ability now to mask the social security numbers on the w2 so obviously, if you've taken advantage of that, any W-2s that you've generated since then will have the social security number mat masked. So the true social security number will not be on the W-2. But for any W-2s that were generated prior to that point, those will still have a social security number. Um, unfortunately, that's just something we can't really get around because those are PDF files that are stored in the file archive. So if you want those available for return in the employee self-service, um, you know, those will contain SSN. But outside of that, we are not storing, and those are not stored in the employee self-service. They are, however, re retrieved from USPS and, and available for viewing or downloading from the employee self-service application. But we are not storing the social security number in any way inside of this application, uh, unless you are using it as the employee number. So hence the reason that I would suggest that uh, you do not do that, that and other reasons. So if we pop over here, we have contact information. This is obviously going to show us their address, uh, phone numbers, email addresses. Um, we have date information. So this includes um, the dates that come from USPS or if there are custom dates that you have established um, through the, the date code mechanism that exists. Uh, and then we have a qualifications tab, which just breaks down some information uh, associated with experience and, you know, some EMIS reportable information um, associated with the employee. Uh, and once again, you can show all of these, you can show only some of these, uh, this is configurable. And depending upon, and once again, a lot of this configuration uh, is going to come over directly from the kiosk. So based on how you had that configured in the legacy kiosk is how it will initially uh, also be configured in the employee self-service application. Uh, okay, next up we have supervisor, I'm sorry, positions, position details. Uh, so right now I have this uh, configured such that it's showing active and, in, in, active and inactive positions. Uh, once again, this is configurable. You can only show active. You can show there's options for, I think, terminated and maybe deceased, I believe. Um, I think that's right. But at any rate, you, you can configure which positions you want to have um, shown here to the employee. And as I mentioned previously, this configuration will come over based on how you had this established in the, the legacy kiosk application. So if we drop this down, you know, there's some information about the, um, uh, the employee's position here. Uh, some of these fields are also configurable, which I will, um, I will show when we, when we jump over to the other, um, the other employee that I'm using for testing that has, uh, some, some more, uh, more access than, than this particular person does. Um, so, you know, obviously we have the information concerning the position, uh, leave eligibility flags. These will control what, uh, of these three leave types are available for displaying. Um, that's one piece that, that controls that. There's also some configuration that also has a, has an impact on that. Uh, and then what we did here is um, we actually uh, modeled this to be more of a direct correlation with the way this data exists inside of USPS. Because as you know, with the uh, in classic USPS, you there was no concept of a compensation. 
Uh, but we added that uh, when we rolled out the new uh, application. This this helps a lot with um, new contracts, mid-year contract changes, et cetera. Um, but we've actually broken this down now so that you'll see if they have more than one compensation that's active for a given position, uh, obviously that information would be displayed down here. Normally, most people have a single active compensation, except maybe for, you know, like I said, certain uh, periods in, in, in the course of the contract where maybe the old contract's paying off and the new one is uh, is beginning or something of that of that nature. Um, okay. Also, uh, as the legacy kiosk had, we have the ability to view and print pay slip information. This information does come directly from USPS. This I'm you can you can view it by clicking this. You can download it by clicking this. This is actually not a real pay slip. It's just some junk data that we uh, generated in the test application for the sake of showing something. Um, I don't have W twos loaded. However, if you had W twos loaded, um, once again I loaded, I should say the the USPS instance that this is actually connected to does not have any W two um, files associated with it. But in your live USPS instance, you know, you will see here all the various tax years, um, along with where's showing control number uh, from the W-2. And they will have the ability to view and download the W-2 as well as they did um, in, in the prior application. Um, uh, yep, here's your leave. So here's your leave information. Uh, we have here, the first tab is going to show the leave balances. Uh, some of what's shown here is also configurable. Um, we, we'll, I can briefly show that as well when we jump over. Um, but you know, this should be pretty, pretty self-explanatory. Here's your personal sick vacation. Um, here's your current balance over here. Um, information about beginning balance, et cetera. Uh, then on this, on this same, uh, screen, we have absences. So this is going to show me all the absences that have been, uh, posted to USPS. So anything that has been exported, posted into USPS is gonna show in this particular view. And similar to our other applications, we have filters. So I can select something here. I can also begin to uh, type something here if I want to, um, and it'll limit the, the options available. I guess they didn't have any vacation leave. That wasn't a great one to pick. Um, but here you can see, uh, you know, then it's just going to show me the professional leave. You know, obviously we can filter on other items here. Um, and for activity date, uh, this is a little, maybe a little different than how we've done it in prior apps. But uh, you can directly under activity date, we could filter a date range here. So it looks like I have uh, either 2021. Let's just do that. So we'll say, I'm going to type it. I don't want to. I could theoretically uh, try and you know go all the way back to 2021 and, and pick it off the calendar here. But for this particular example, I'm just gonna go ahead and filter this. Um, and let me, I'm gonna check something real quick here. Okay, that's what I thought. Yeah, the, the display and the actual way the filter works is a little different. But if I just do like 01, 01, 2021, um, and it does actually bring the calendar up. Um, I left the stop date empty there, but basically this is just showing me anything, um, you know, post 2021 uh, that is is available for the position leave information. Uh, also, these are sortable. I mean, this is this is all pretty standard, I think, based on the way our other applications work. If you're familiar, um, but you know, I can I can sort either uh, ascending or descending based on clicking uh, right here. Uh, this is also telling me what the primary uh, sort versus secondary sort versus um, what would that be? Trinary? I may have just made that up. Third sort. Um, then over here, uh, we have a very similar grid for uh, accumulations. So we did split out absence transactions versus accumulation transactions. Um, so here you can see, and don't get too hung up on some of this data. Once again, this is test data. So we've been kind of going a little crazy on this. Um, but yeah, any accumulations that have been posted in USPS, you, you would see these here as well. All right. Um, I'll pause for a second. Mark, J Mark, um, Michelle, are there any questions that I need to address? Okay. Hearing none, we'll move forward. 
Um, so let's go to leave calendar and we'll come back to leave request. Um, one of the things that we did do uh, here is we we added uh, quite a few more calendar options than I think the legacy kiosk had. Um, so right now you're just seeing the you know default monthly calendar. Uh, you know, this is the the current date, therefore it's going to show as a slightly different color here to signify this is today. Um, I have some leaves here that are showing as blue, which essentially means that these, if I click on the details, are an initiated state. When I click on them, then I can see actually some more, um, you know, some more details concerning that request. Whereas here, I'm obviously just seeing, you know, the leave type and, you know, the date that it pertains to. Um, down here, I have one that's red. If I click on that, you'll see it was canceled. Uh, we are showing canceled and rejected requests as a, a red in color on the calendars. And then I believe approved uh, request will show as green. Yeah, pretty sure that's correct. Uh, so as I said, uh, we do have some filters available here. So if you, on these calendars, if you want to filter by you know, only by specific position. I think these are all, well, let's see. I don't know if they're all associated with the, okay. So one of those was not associated with the custodian position. Therefore it, it went away. Um, I can clear that. I can also just look at particular leave types. If I only want to see certain leave types, I can clear all filters with that button. Let's apply the filter that comes back. Um, this uh, I can I can go through the months obviously by you know clicking um, these arrows if I want to I can also click here and you know go to a specific um, specific month essentially um, if I want to do that let's go back to May um, this is a quick mechanism where if I get myself like way messed up somehow I'm way in the future I can just click that and it'll take me back to um, the current month. Uh, so that's kind of the controls there. Oh, they do have the ability to, cr to create a new leave request from the calendar as well. We wired that in if they, if they want to do that. Um, so as I said, there's a whole bunch of, we, we added a whole bunch of different calendars here. Quite honestly, some of these are probably not super useful for the employee themselves. Who's just simply looking at their own leave. Um, likely the, the monthly calendar is going to be just fine. Um, but as you see, as you'll see, when we get into, um, some employees, some employees that have a uh, higher level of access, they have access to different kinds of calendars, such as district leave calendars, the monthly calendar can get kind of busy. Uh, if you're seeing everybody's leave across the entire, um, district for a given month. So that's where, some of these list view calendars actually become, I think, much more useful. So if I click on a monthly list view, the, yeah, we're going to, I noticed this, the, the highlighting is not great here. We should probably change that so you can still see that when you're highlighted over it. But at any rate, um, what this is showing me here now is instead of the, you know, the calendar view, essentially, I'm getting a, just a list view, giving me the, uh, you know, the date, the uh, start time and end time and the leave type. And similar to um, the calendar, I can click on each of these and get a much more expanded uh, view of the information associated with that. Um, so yeah, the list view I think will be helpful, as I said, specifically with um, those, those leave calendars for probably like district leave administrators that see everything, maybe supervisors as well, depending upon how many employees they supervise. Uh, we also have a couple other views here. Um, so we have, you know, the lists are all pretty much the same. You can do a, a monthly list, weekly list, yearly list. Um, we also have these hourly calendars. Uh, these are a slightly different view. Let's do it by week. And let's see, where was their leave at? Uh, okay, here we go. So this one was uh, uh, canceled, but nonetheless, so the the difference with the hourly calendar views is obviously now we're getting a, a breakdown of this uh, so that it's showing us um, not just like, hey, there was a leave taking on, taken on this day, but it's actually giving us the start and end time and then correlating that on the calendar. So you can kind of see, uh, okay, like this employee is going to be out at, you know, a half day and then this employee is going to be out the next half of the day. So it's just a little different view. Uh, I can click on that too and, and get some some increased detail. Okay, 
So, yeah, and I mean, certainly we, we added a lot of options here. Uh, as I said, some of these will be useful for supervisors and district admins. Um, if the employees find them useful, great. But I assume for the most part, employees will be pretty happy with this uh, this calendar right here. Um, and before I submit the leave request, I'm going to go ahead and just show this real quick, too. There is a help <clears throat> option. If I go under about, a lot of this information likely you don't care about. Um, this is kind of some internal information that uh, that we actually, you know, may may need in certain instances when we're trying to, you know, debug a potential issue. But the one thing that you may actually occasionally want to reference is the version that you're on. Uh, you know, right now this is a uh, this is a development. Well, it's technically not really a development version, but it's. Uh, You'll see, you won't see this. This snapshot here is just uh, related to the fact that we this is based off of an adult development build that we we uh, created based on the last actual um, uh, early access release that we we published. Normally, you'll see a version number that uh, correlates directly with the version number that you'll find on our release notes pages. Um, but if you look at release notes and you say, you know, we say. Oh, we added this really cool feature in version 1.2.0. And, and you're like, well, I don't see this new feature in my application. Uh, you know, this is an area where you can come and check and see what version you're on. And it may just be that you haven't been uh been up upgraded to the the most recent version of the application. So that's probably about the only thing in here that you 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 typically would uh have a reason to reference. And then we do have a link here to the documentation. Um, these are currently under development, um, we do have uh, quite a bit out there already. I can probably open this up and show it if I can. There we go. Um, so he here's the, you know, we have the good start of the uh, user manual established out here, um, but you know, there is, there is still a bit more work to do on this, um, but we do have a link directly from the application to the documentation, so. Okay, let me, check here on time uh, we're doing okay um all right so let me go ahead and uh create a leave request now for this employee so we can see how that works uh one thing i didn't mention yet but i should um i should mention is that uh we we another thing that we were taking into consideration as we we're developing this application is trying to make this mobile friendly uh particularly in areas like this where you're creating a leave request um and I'm going to defer showing you this, I think, until the very end. Uh, there's Google Chrome has the ability to uh, simulate a cell phone view. So I can show you what this would actually look like on a cell phone. But this uh, it, it, the the sort of developer tools that 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 work to make that happen, they can get get a little flaky sometimes and actually mess with the application. So I don't want to I don't want to do that till the very end, but I'll I will show you what this looks like. But as I said, we are very much um ensuring that uh, uh, you know things like being able to create leave requests, supervisors being able to approve leave requests is uh, very much doable for mobile devices. Obviously, we know in today's day and age, uh, many people are primarily accessing resources on phones. So we wanted to try to uh, take that into consideration as we, as we created this application. Okay, so I'm actually gonna submit a a leave request for this test employee under their custodian position. Uh, and once I do this, then I will log out and log back in as this individual's actual supervisor so we can uh, take a look at that. So under here, <clears throat> these options that I'm seeing here are, are both a, a combination of the configuration options that I have established inside of the employee self-service application and the and the leave that this person is eligible for based on the position that I am currently submitting leave to. So I will just submit a sick leave. Um, when I select sick, you can see it tells me that here's my leave balance before the request that includes um, any leave requests that are currently uh, in progress or outstanding, meaning not exported to USPS. So this is a combination of my balance in uh, USPS plus any outstanding leave that I have. And obviously for this test employee, they're actually in the red right now. Um, but that's okay for the case, sake of this demo, we're just going to go ahead and let that happen. Um, you know, I can put a, 
reason for the leave in here if I if I want to, um, obviously. Um, and then I have my start my start date of leave and my end date of leave. And you can see that the seven to three is automatically populated in here for me um, based on my defaults that I had selected. Also, this all eights phone number, if you remember, that was my my default phone number. Um, so let's say we're going to do, well, let's make it a little bit more complicated so I can give you a uh, better um, overview of that secondary uh, box that comes up. And uh, let's say it's going to be a full two days. Okay, so I'm going to take um, leave from, you know, the 10th and the 11th. Uh, 7 a.m. on the 10th to 3 p.m. on the 11th. It's going to equate to two full days of leave. Um, I can add some comments about that. Um, uh, this is the substitute needed. This correlates to, there's some configuration here in terms of the default substitute, if, if it requires it or not. Um, that also can be selectable in some cases, depending upon the configuration settings. Uh, so anyways, I'm going to go ahead and submit this request. You're going to see now, here's the secondary sort of dialogue that, um, oh, that was a Saturday. Well, that's okay. It doesn't matter that much for, well, we can change it just to make it a little bit more realistic. Let's say they're going to take it from the 9th to the 10th. Um, okay, let's do that. Uh, yeah, that's okay. Uh, it does warn me because I because I entered a date that's in the past. It's just telling me basically, well, it's giving me two warnings. It's telling me number one that um, you know I'm exceeding my sick balance, uh, and it's also telling me that you know I have a start date in the past. But for the sake of this, I'm just going to ignore that and I'm going to say, yeah, that's fine, create it. And now you can see it defaulted both both uh, those one days. It didn't do that previously because I had a Saturday in there, so it was like you know that's a weekend. Are you really taking that day? Um, but normally. If it's clear in terms of there's two days in the date range and I'm taking two days of leave, then it's gonna it's gonna go ahead and uh, you know kind of default where it thinks that needs to go. But I could theoretically change this around if I needed to. Um, so let me go ahead and accept this. Okay, now that leave has been created. Um, so if I go over to the supervisor view now, let's go ahead and log out of this employee. And I have a supervisor here that I will log in as. Uh, this person actually has, um, for the sake of trying to limit the amount of time that I'm jumping around from user to user to user, this person actually has uh, more than just the supervisor roles. So some of the information here, like sub coordinator, for instance, this would not normally be something a supervisor would see unless they were also uh, set up as a sub coordinator. Um, but uh, so anyways, but, and, and I'll go through some additional uh, pieces here that are, are configured based on the fact that this person has the, the district uh, manager role associated with them. But for now, let me just go to um, leave request approval, because as you remember, we submitted that, uh, that leave request. There's one out here that I had submitted previously. Here is the leave request that I just submitted for uh, May 9th, May 10th, two days, category sick. Um, I can view this if I want to view the the, the full details here. Um, because I'm the sub coordinator, I can. Uh, uh, I guess I. Strange. I thought I could check it from here. Um, uh, maybe I have to do it through the sub uh, coordinator view. I thought I could do it directly here, but I guess not. Uh, sorry. But at any rate, I can view the details of this leave. This leave. Um, I also have a tab here to um, view the. Uh, the daily details in terms of how that breaks out, um, uh, you know, by day, uh, then I can approve this directly here. I can reject this. Uh, I can also, if I want to, as a supervisor, if I want to just come in and say, Hey, I'm good with, um, both of these leaves that are showing out here. I want to just approve all of them. Or if there's like, you know, 50 of them or whatever, I can do a select all, I can select just this one approved from here. So there's a, you know, some options here in terms of, do I want to view the details? And this, I think is pretty similar to kiosk. Approve from here, reject from here, close this, or do I want to interact with the grid itself and just approve directly from here? So I'll go ahead and approve this leave. And I can put a note in here, um, you know, if I, if I want to convey this to the employee, 
Um, they will receive an email, assuming they're, they've enabled email notifications. Um, and leaves approved, disappears from my, my leave approval grid as a supervisor. So pretty standard. Uh, you know, if you're used to using the kiosk, I'm assuming that, uh, th that that would be pretty clear from that perspective. Um, so obviously, you know, as a supervisor, I have a lot of the same basic uh, views available. Um, as I mentioned, this person is uh, a sub coordinator. So I can go in here and see uh, what is outstanding in terms of what needs a substitute scheduled. Um, so here is the one that I just approved. Um, you can see the status is showing as approved. Uh, if I want to view this, uh, I can bring this up and then I actually need to go into edit mode. Uh, but now I can, um, I thought I could do this directly from approval, but I was incorrect there. I have to actually go into this view. Um, then I can, I can schedule a substitute. I can add information in here, you know, substitutes name, phone number, comments, et cetera. So this is a recreation of the sub coordinator, um, option that directly existed in the kiosk if people uh, weren't utilizing something like ASOP in order to do that. Um, one thing I will show real quick, this shows up uh, for supervisors in a variety of views, um, also for employees for their own leave. If you want to see, uh, you know, what's the approval trail here, you can see that Brian Horn, which was my employee that I submitted the leave under, uh, you know, submitted that leave at 10.09 uh, a.m., and then I came in as a supervisor and I approved that leave as, uh, you know, uh, Vanessa Walters in this case told, you know, the note was get well soon. Here's the time I did it. Uh, you know, this, this leave approval flow, obviously I just have a, uh, a single, um, supervisor. Uh, and once again, sometimes, you know, you may have multiple supervisors that need to approve a leave. Uh, and you know, all of that information would be displayed here, uh, in the, uh, leave approval trail. Um, and those, as I said, I think multiple times now, the workflows that you have established in the legacy kiosk will come over as part of that import. So you won't have to suffer the pain of reconfiguring all of that information. And then this is just, once again, a, a view of the day breakdown. Okay. Uh, let's see what else. Um, so let me show you this, um, if I go under users and then I want to look at, this is the user that I'm currently logged in as this, um, Vanessa Walters here. So if I view this individual, as I said, like all of the access here is controlled by roles. Uh, these roles, uh, for the most part correlate back to the roles that existed in the legacy chaos application. And with the user import, the roles come over as well. So whatever roles your people have, uh, they should, you know, have them uh, post import without manual manipulation on your part. We can edit this. Um, so here is the, somebody was asking earlier about, um, you know, can I, do I have to use two-factor authentication? Here's where this is configured. I can enable two-factor authentication here. There's a little bit of configuration detail behind the scenes that obviously has to happen for it to be able to actually work with Duo. But in terms of if the user is, uh, is, does require two-factor authentication or not, that's configured here on the user screen. And then this is the Active Directory. Are they using um, external authentication? So Active Directory in integration, that, that can occur here as well. Um, but what I really want to show you is if you, if we drop this down, here's all the roles that exist for, for this person. I'm going to give them the announcement board manager. They may, give, I don't know if they get that district manager. I'm going to go ahead and give them the announcement board manager role. Um, district manager is sort of like a catch-all that encompasses uh, several different things. Um, this is kind of, uh, you can see, uh, th this is the role that we've created um, that uh, is kind of the equivalent of a, if you want to call it a district admin. So somebody that can do um, many of the things uh, at the, at the, at the district that, or at the school that is restricted, but I have a variety of other, um, options out here in terms of roles and my, uh, you know, my, my side menu here and what I'm able to do is going to be controlled based on the roles that I currently have established. So let's go ahead and save that. And I think I already had the announcement board cause I was a district manager, but it doesn't hurt to add, uh, additional roles. Um, uh, obviously if you take roles away that can't have an impact, but okay. So I just wanted to kind of show you real quick the roles there. Um, 
this, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here, but this is really your workflows. Like I said, they're going to come over initially as um, established in the legacy kiosk, but uh, we have the idea of groups and group chains. So you basically create a group. Um, let's take a look at this one. So here's a group that we're calling cafeteria group. Uh, we can add, we can select whether this is an or group, meaning uh, whoever's in this group, one person can approve, and then it's considered approved for the sake of that group. And it moves on to the next group, which you'll see when I briefly talk about group chains, or I can make this an and group, which means that everybody that's listed here has to approve before it uh, moves on to the next step in the group chain or workflow process, depending on the terminology that you want to use. So we establish our groups here. Uh, once again, comes over from, from legacy kiosk. So you shouldn't have to do much initially, but if you ever need to make modifications, this is where you would do it. And then group chains are basically our workflows. So if we look at this cafeteria workflow, um, uh, so we have, uh, here's the, these are the groups that are available and these are the groups that are selected. Um, so right now I only have a single group in this workflow, which is, you know, once again, that it's an or group, but it's that single supervisor that we looked at previously in that group. Um, so basically once that any leave that flows to this particular workflow, once it's approved by that one individual in that group, then it's considered approved. Um, similar to the, uh, legacy kiosk, there's a variety of options we can use when configuring these workflows to determine, uh, which leaves flow to that, um, specific leave types, specific pay groups, um, specific employees and positions even. Um, et cetera, et cetera. So those correlate pretty directly back to the options that were available in the legacy kiosk application. Um, one other thing real briefly, um, we could spend a lot of time in here, but we're kind of running up against time here. So I don't want to spend too much time, but one thing that it will be important to take into consideration is the priority of these. Uh, you, you, you essentially want to have your your more specific workflows first so that, uh, because the way this is gonna work when I when I submit a leave, it's gonna take a look at these, uh, these group chains um, or workflows and determine, uh, it's gonna go in here and it's gonna say, okay, for this employee, you know, this pay group, et cetera, et cetera, what's the first workflow that, it, that, that, uh, that encapsulates this particular position? So if you have like a super general workflow first, and then you put a more specific workflow next. Um, you know, obviously, if it gets in, if it gets captured by that general workflow, then it's never going to get down to your specific workflow. So there is some ordering. Ordering here is somewhat important. Um, and you can see here we have abilities to to adjust uh, priorities on on these um, in order to you know move them up and down in terms of uh, the priority at which they take effect. Okay, so let me see. As I said, we're kind of um, getting up against time a little bit, but let me just very briefly, we'll go to the, let's go to the district leave calendar. Uh, this person has access to that based on the roles. This is going to be the busiest calendar. Um, so you can see, as I said, this isn't super terrible in terms of reading, but it's pretty busy, right? Um, so this is where I think this monthly list becomes a lot more useful. Uh, to actually see this information in a consumable fashion. So, um, and then, you know, filters as well, if they want to uh, filter this data down uh, so that they don't necessarily see everybody on here. Um, this person does have the ability to control custom links. So uh, as a uh, district manager, I can uh, manage custom links. I can delete links that I've created already. I can, you know, view links. I can create new links. Um, this person also has the ability to manage the whitelist. This is a new feature that we added. Um, basically here, um, there's some configuration that we can, this works in a couple of ways. Uh, I can, I can add links here. Um, I'm sorry, this, I can add, uh, domains here basically that are safe. So meaning any links that, uh, are in my, ITC's domain or my school district domain, I'm okay with people clicking those, those links and those links being displayed in the employee self-service. Um, configuration option allows you to say, you can have links that aren't in the whitelisted domains, but uh, if somebody clicks on one of those links, we want to just tell them, hey, you're about to leave the you know, employee kiosk application and you're going to a 
you know, an external domain or whatever, you know, do you want to proceed or not? Or the other option is you can say, no, I only want to allow links uh, displayed inside of this application if they're in these particularly particular whitelisted domains, in which case nobody will be able to even add a link that doesn't uh, correlate to one of those whitelisted domains. So just a little, little additional security uh, configuration um, option there. Uh, oh, I should have done this previously. I wanted to show you this, but um, we'll just go in. So uh, I can probably show up for this employee actually, hang on. So if I go under the employee profile, um, you can see here, I have this button here that says create new data change request. Uh, this functionality existed in the legacy kiosk, uh, but the way it worked there was if I, if I did this, the leave administrator, I believe would, or the, or the HR administrator, one of those roles would actually get an email that said, Hey, this person wants this changed. Um, you know, here's the information, here's the old value, the new value, go log into USPS and make the change. So we, we made this a little bit, uh, more useful. Um, so if the employee wants to submit a data change request, they click that button. And then you can see here, I have, um, here's the current value. Here's what I want the new value to be. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, some of this is randomly generated data. So there's, uh, uh, some, some weird, um, names sometimes. Well, let's say yeah, my first name is not father. Um, I, I, I don't, uh, that's not an honorific that I currently use. So I'm going to say, uh, this is my new first name. Okay. I'm going to submit that. Now this doesn't automatically update in, uh, USPS. Uh, this person uh, that I'm working on right now, they are, they have access to actually view a uh, data change request. So you can see here, I have, um, there's several out here that we've created over the course of testing, but here, here's the one that I just did this Vanessa Walters. Um, I can theoretically approve here, similar to leave request, but you know, normally you're probably going to want to at least look at this to see what they are asking to be changed. Um, so you can see here, I have sort of a a green uh, border around the values that she um, changed, in this case, the first name. Uh, if there were other things that were changed on these other screens, you would see similar um, sort of identifier here to show you what data changed. And then I can say, uh, yeah, okay, I'm good with that change. Let's approve it. Or no, you can't change that. I'm going to reject that. In this case, I'll go ahead and approve it. Um, it just prompts me, are you sure you want to do it? Yes. Uh, now that, uh, you can see is down here under the approved. Now there's a two, two step process. What I have the ability to do now is I can actually say, okay, well, I approved this request, but now I want to post it to USPS. So this is a direct posting to USPS. So if I post this, it will actually make the modification in USPS to change the first name of this person from the current value to the new value that, that, that they set. So we, we made that, you know, as I said, because we are tightly integrating with um, USPS, we're able to, you know, kind of streamline that process a little bit versus requiring um, the employee to simply be notified and then have to manually key that information. Okay, um, let's see. So, oh, one thing I wanted to show you is the announcement manager as well five minutes, uh, probably have some questions to address, but let me show you this. And then, um, you know, there, there's a, I know, I apologize. There's kind of a lot here, but I'm trying to, trying to hit the, the key features, um, particularly things that obviously, uh, you know, users at schools would be, would be interested in seeing how they work. Um, but let me show you the announcement manager and then I will go ahead and, uh, pause and ensure that, uh, all, all questions that have been asked have been addressed. Um, Oh, and I did tell you too, I was going to show you uh, the landing page is slightly different here. Uh, you remember when we came in as just the employee, uh, we only saw the announcements and the custom links. But now because I am a supervisor, I actually have a you know pending, pending workflow task. So leaves that I need to approve. Uh, so you can see right now, I still have one outstanding uh, that they'd entered under this other leave category. And uh, I can view right from here and approve if I want to do that. Um, so that's kind of a nice little feature as a supervisor, I can just come right into here and see, um, you know, see what's outstanding for me. Uh, it gives me a little bit of a quick view into that. Um, 
All right, so announcements. So here I have some uh, announcements that were established. Um, you can see there's actually a couple out here that have already expired because I had them set uh, in the, in the this one, hold on, activation date. Oh, this one looks a little strange. I'm not sure about that one. Um, yeah, okay, anyways. Uh, but the when I create a, uh, I just want to show you the creation of a new one. So when I create a new leave request, I want to say, let's say this is going to become active today and I only want it to last until, I don't know, Monday, we'll say. Um, and uh, we'll say, whatever. Uh, there was a water leak in the elementary, at whatever. Uh, you know, this can obviously be um, whatever you uh, want it to be. Uh, thank goodness for uh, Google's ability to spell and, and, and not mine. Um, <clears throat> there are some, uh, there are some uh, rich text customizations here. So you can, you can get kind of crazy with these if you want to. You can insert images. Uh, you know, you can do various, uh, you know, bolding of, of fonts, uh, make headings if you want things to appear bigger, um, et cetera. So there's quite a bit of, uh, you know, bolded list uh, centering things. So you, you can do quite a bit of customization with um, with these announcements if you choose to do so. Um, but, you know, we're just going to say uh, something here. And then we're going to save it. <clears throat> Uh, now you can see it shows here. And if we go back to the home screen, you know, now everybody in the district is going to see this announcement that there is apparently a water leak in the elementary. I can click on it and, you know, warning to not get your feet wet. So there you go. But yeah, that that's how that works. And that is controlled here. Uh, and as I said, there, that's a role-based configuration. Um, so, and I, I apologize. We're like really up against time here. There were a few other things I wanted to show. Um, let me just, I'm not going to go into detail here, but let me just show you the configuration options. As I said, a lot of these correlate back to the configuration options that you're used to seeing inside of the, um, the, uh, legacy kiosk application with the addition of a few configurations for things that we've added specifically to employee self-service. Um, the one that, uh, sorry, that's the actual email server, um, Yeah, this one, this one I actually will very quickly show. Um, so for, I had mentioned that, you know, we don't have an email server actually configured on this test instance. So it's not sending emails, but this is where you would control what you want your actual emails to look like for various, uh, various stages of the actual leave process. So here um, is when a request is submitted. Uh, this is going to be uh, what's uh, sent to the employee to um, tell them that it was submitted. Um, and uh, I believe to the supervisor as well in that case to tell them that there's an outstanding leave. Um, there's a few things I can add in here as uh, sort of little shortcuts, so to speak. So right now I said, uh, you know, this is the default. A leave request has been submitted with the following details. And then this little tag here indicates that it's going to insert the details of the leave request. Um, so I can do, I can do, you know, I can, the note that was added on it, the leave request, the link. And as I said, these are customizable. So if you want to change, if you want to edit these and you want to modify the, you know, the text of the email that's sent for the various, you know, parts of the approval chain, you can do so. All right. Um, and then the very last thing I'm going to do, because I said I was going to do this, is I'm going to go into create leave request. And I'm going to try and get Zoom out of my way. And I'm going to go under the uh, developer tools. And OK, by default, it actually, yeah. So um, right here, you're seeing. Um, Roughly what this looks like on, let's do a, change it to a Pixel 7. Um, so you can see if I was on a, a cell phone, this is basically the view that I would be display, the, the view that I would get uh, versus the, you know, standard view. So obviously it's putting everything in a single column, utilizing the, the screen real estate, um, and then uh, 
I can enter in information and then and then create the create the lead request. So I just wanted to show that we did, as I said, take uh, this into consideration for, um, you know, if you're on an iPad Pro, that's actually big enough where we can show you the sidebar menu now versus um, the uh, phone, that menu was um, collapsed by default and it's actually down here. So I'd have to click that in order to see it. So yeah, so this this UI will scale based on um, based on device size. Okay, so um, we are pretty much, we're two minutes over time right now. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop there. And um, I'm way, way behind the chat, but Michelle and Jody, I'm sorry, Michelle and Mark, um, are there items uh, in the chat, questions that uh, we need to address before we wrap for today? Or are there any final, if there are final questions that people have, um, you know, feel free to put them in the chat or unmute if you prefer and ask them. Are we good to go on the chat, uh, Michelle and Mark? We're caught up. Yay, nay. I believe that we're pretty much caught up. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any final questions uh, before we, we end for today? And as I said, I'm recording this, so we will make this uh, recording and that uh, small PowerPoint presentation that I presented up front available um, as well. Matt, yeah, we'll probably post it to our, our YouTube channel, so you guys will be able to be on the lookout for that. Okay. And we will capture this chat transcript as well. Um to determine if there was something that we missed. Um, and yeah, the uh, the frontline integration questions that I followed up on, um, I will um, I will convey, I'm trying to think the best way to get those responses back to you. Um, yes, I will I will I will convey those responses to the ITCs, I think is probably the best way to do that. And then the ITCs can, distribute uh, that information to to the actual um, school district personnel. So yes, I will I will make sure that the ITC staff are aware of the answers to the couple of questions that um, we could not directly answer as part of the uh, session today. Okay, well, um, I think we are probably good at this point. So as I said, we'll make this available. We will capture this chat transcript. And uh, if we did miss something, we will um, definitely make an effort to circle back and get you an answer. So thank you for um, attending today. I hope that uh, you know, you're know excited for the rollout of this application and uh, that you believe it. Uh, it looks pretty good in terms of the work we've done. And I hope you all have a very good day.